Hello everybody, Boca team here. We're going to talk about the uh, the boosts as we promised. A few weeks ago we put out a video and, and said that we would kind of communicate with y'all as we found uh, our way through this and we felt like we're going to, well here's, here's the deal, we're going to call this video the 2022 Patriot Boost Riders Digest because because we got three guys here. We got uh, Chase and Quinn. Uh, if you don't know who they are, they're it. Uh, anyway, we're we're going to talk about kind of our impressions of these things, and as we've worked through sort of the pros and cons, goods and bads, and and there's a lot of information out there on the internet. I feel like we probably need to respond to some of it. Uh, we do have our other team member, Lola, over here. She's uh, <clears throat> doing some testing. She's our Vogue dog. Durability <laughs> She's testing. doing durability <laughs> testing, chewing everything. Uh, anyway, so so a few of the issues that have come up have kind of created some buzz on the internet, and and right now I was going to try to compress this into some really short video to get everybody's attention or whatever, and and I feel like we can't really do that with what needs to be said and talked about and to be honest about everything yeah. and there's move so forward. There, there's a lot going on. Uh, Boost is a new product, as everybody knows, um, and I and I think that overall everybody is rem I would say amazed at the total performance that's the one thing that i mean we said we were going to deliver and, and we did this these are 200 horsepower pump gas units stock no machines that. right out of the box right so, so so we got that right but but there's some other things and there's some things that we'll talk about as as we move through it and one of the first things i, w I wanted to say is that so so the three of us take these these three machines out and we put pump gas in them and we and we begin the process of running through break-in and uh for the first so oh, I'd say 25 miles, we're all just giggles. I mean, we have deep snow and we're giggles. These things are like, I can't believe that they pulled this off, that, that, that it all worked as well as it did. Yeah. Right, we're all enamored. I mean, it is wheelies and bow ties for, 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 for miles. So, so we're having a good time. And then uh, there, there's kind of a honeymoon stage, I would yeah. say, with Seems the so. break-in, right? So they start down this break-in right at about 25 miles or so, they sort of tip over where they won't tolerate all the break-in fuel and they yeah. start bogging really bad, right? And we were kind of discouraged at first. We're like, oh no. A lot of people having the same problem too. So. <clears throat> right, so we're getting reports Seems of it. Seems to be it. pretty consistent across most of them. Yeah. So we, anyway, we, uh, <laughs> we, we start work on, on, on mapping and looking and logging. So every one of these units, just so, so you know, we're using, we're using a logger. Um, we're, we're using our boat VTI and, and we're logging these things and we're coming back to the trailer and we're looking at the data and we're seeing, uh, we're seeing a couple different things that are attributing to this bog. And I think the first thing that jumped out at us in that deep snow was the amount of disparity from partial throttle to full throttle in deep snow with respect to intake uh, mm. pressures, right? So that there's a sensor, uh, an intake sensor um, in the air box up high, uh, everybody can see, uh, right before it enters the turbo, that measures the air pressure. And, and we, we were surprised to see three, four, and even five KPA differentials or deltas as we call them. And that delta would tip these things over into a pretty significant bog. And though at first we thought well, we thought it was cap off, right? So, mm -hmm. but then, but then, then we're you know right side up, and we're still having it. Yeah. And mm -hmm. keep in mind, it's during break-in, so this is a and period deep, of time. Deep snow. And deep snow, right? Yeah. It's a period of time when there's more fuel being induced than what the motor will tolerate, and we're drawing them into this into this negative. And yeah. for those of you who don't understand this dynamic, if you starve a turbo of inlet air. It'll have a more profound effect on boost temperature than even inducing, say, warmer air or colder air. So this is constantly something that people maybe don't understand. What happens is you run outside of the efficiency. And I'll try to keep this not too technical here, but if you run outside of the efficiency on a turbo <clears throat> in terms of the available intake air, you will cause the compressor to work much harder and ultimately you will impart more heat too into the boost temp. So that's what we're seeing was this correspondence between the, the, the harder we drew that in to those those negative KPAs, the higher we saw boost temperatures go. 
too. Yeah. So there's temperature sender, uh, temps are sending unit on the on the other side of the turbo as well. So so we're looking at all this data, and, and maybe I should have my computer here and kind of show you what I'm looking at. But honestly, half of you guys don't care. And like I said, this isn't going to be a short video, but it's I'm not going to bore you with a bunch of details. But what it revealed was that 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 this intake is wholly wholly uh, inadequate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> For deep so snow, right? So long story short, we we've had to. Yeah, Build so we had to come up with something. More. We need much more. <clears throat> so we came up with a plan, and, and we started playing around different things. You'll see holes in the side of some of them and whatever, and and and, uh, and, and came up with a kind of a, a Band-Aid, if you will, until we create, we are in works of creating a new intake that'll correspond with this uh, helium hood as well as another one that I'm working with Boondocker on that will come out uh, right forward of this recoil rope where this removable piece is. And uh, a couple different variants of that. Uh, I know some people have called for for a snorkel, and that'll likely be uh, likely be available as well. And, and those will have a very uh, well profoundly positive effect on on performance. R really, it does make a difference. It's not even about cold as much as it is about uh, air. You got to have the air available, and and that's a that's a really big deal. So so we noticed that right away. But what we also noticed is uh, as soon as we flash the break-in timers off. At about when 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 we all got tired of bogging, yeah, <laughs> like you're just gonna shut the braking timers off, like see what it does. Sufficiently broken. <laughs> yeah, I mean we had like what 40 miles on them. They're still getting them fuel, <laughs> yep. so we flashed the break-in timers off, and uh, and then we found that uh, the, the units didn't weren't as apt to mm -hmm. to do that. So, yep. and in fact, as as time went on, uh, the bog issue almost completely disappeared with yep. respect to having the. The, the, the minor intake mod that we did make to affect that difference as well as uh, getting out of break it right yeah. so <clears throat> so then let's 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 move on so so rider wise um, I mean we we arguably chase might be the most advanced rider in our group yeah I don't know if that's true or I not got in I mean, trouble one day he got mad at me for riding it and doing so many wheelies <laughs> well I mean you got to give the belt a break every now and then yeah, I mean, the guy's like Rah! Every single this time we stop. Hoot. I mean, we, yeah, we'd stop to let the things cool off, open the things. Chase is just driving wheelies around us everywhere. So uh, every time we'd get to a hill, it was, like I said, bow ties and hop overs. I don't blame you. It's pretty fun. Yeah. yeah I don't regret is. a bit of it. Yeah. But when it comes to getting up the steep stuff, I'll still say that Quinn and I are the ones that stop waiting for Chase because he's, yeah. he's horsing around down there doing bow ties and hop overs. And we're just about <laughs> getting the work done, so whatever. Um, no, I'm just, just joking. But... Uh, so, so, but but all the cool aspects of the matrix that that make the matrix slash the matrix slash the short tunnel, the centralized weight, um, and uh, those aspects of it became very noticeable, right? Isn't Truly that? remarkable what this did alone to the, the snowmobile. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just having that tunnel and everything with it, I mean, man, it's it's almost hard to get the thing stuck. I mean, it's one of those deals where. You can bury that thing, and as long as you've got traction, it will keep getting it. And Let's talk about that, because that's come that up date. a lot too, mm -hmm. right? How many of these now have we seen? In fact, we could walk around the shop and show you a couple of them that are like this. The Slash is really cool. It's new to people short, that haven't had short tunnels. It's like, wow, this is really fun. Yep. And in and, and early season, it's really fun that you can really just dig to infinity. But there's something down there. Yep. It's uh, generally rocks, dirt, trees. logs, and trees, and things. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> So when you when you're like, oh my god, this thing doesn't get stuck, that, that just threw that little you know radar up there. Keep saying, in mind, there's a there's a big cooler underneath. Yeah, there's a big intercooler underneath there. So we've got a bunch of these units that have had, uh, you know, people just pin it, wiggle. Thanks, Brant, for for telling buddy to pin and wiggle. It's uh, told a lot of snowmobiles too. So pin and wiggle when you're certain you're not going to get down to dirt and rocks because that's a bad thing. <laughs> And anyway, we've got a lot of damaged units. The slash is particularly sensitive to that. So guys, take it easy. The cooler is <clears> vulnerable. Yeah. Vulnerable. I mean, the cooler's in a you know it's a great big cooler under there, and there's no place for that snow to go as you as you just auger in, and you're like, holy crap, I could dig dig down and go, and maybe I'm not stuck. But well, you might be you might be out four grand getting all that stuff replaced too. Yeah. So because man, when it pitches them up through there, it just absolutely yeah. obliterates them. Yeah. I mean, we had I mean, one. The track speed on these is what is impressive too and just thinking about something getting sucked in there when the right 200 floating. horsepower thing I mean, 60 mile an hour fast. track speed mm -hmm. yeah You're and we had one that went took a rock through the tunnel through the heat exchanger into the fuel cell it, it can happen so yeah, big one. be be don't be stupid 
Uh, anyway, that's just a good point. But they are. They are remarkable in that way. Mm-hmm. I mean, and, 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 and the power is like, holy cow. Mm-hmm. But all of the little things that Matrix did, right? I mean, even in the front of the machine, they moved way closer to the rider, and that really matters. And you'll see here, this one's got a Diamond S, uh, titanium Diamond S silencer on it. This, the, uh, we can talk about that real quick. The silencer dynamically, in my opinion, made one of the biggest differences with how the machine felt. Yes. That weight was significant. Sign- ultra significant. Yeah. And, and so the machine's more responsive. It feels more reactive to peg weighting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The ability for the common consumer to lighten this machine with only a few mods is, is yep. a yeah. lot. You can I'll spend silencer. not a lot of money and take a lot of weight off. I think that's what blew us away. I mean, I think <clears throat> Quinn mentioned it first. He was maybe the first one to pull a hood off. And he's like, holy cow, this thing's heavy. <laughs> holy cow. So yeah. throw it on a scale, it's like a 15 pound hood, 14 something. Um, uh, th- that's the assembly, of course, but headlight with the, hood. With the 7S gauge. Yeah, with the 7S gauge. And, and anyway, pretty chunky. And Which so. I trade for a lot of. Right, that's I another cool thing. That's yeah, another cool thing to talk one about. Of the best advances. Yeah. So, uh, so let's talk about weight. A lot of people were surprised to learn that this thing was a couple of pounds heavier than an Axis. Mm-hmm. But when they rode it, it feels 20 pounds sure lighter feel that way yeah. right and, and that was one of the first things people said how, how did it gain weight well i'll tell you where it gained weight it gained weight up here on this hood 15 pounds a lot of weight and and if you, i'm pretty sure if you take the body work off of these the body work is a little bit heavier uh if you take the body work off of these i'm uh, i'm a hundred percent certain i don't know that we've quantified it here but but this is what the engineers tell me is that the, the machine is significantly lighter without the body work if you were to strip both an axis and a matrix. Mm-hmm. So they did a lot of little mm-hmm. internal stuff. Not to mention, obviously, moving the weight closer to the rider makes it easier to dynamically affect changes to you know the machine's attitude and whatnot. But <clears throat> just so you know, that is kind of that is a big deal that the machines are they feel much lighter. But when you actually make changes like the skin's hood, which I think is about eight pounds, and this silencer, which is about fifteen pounds or something, it is a lot. Um, man, you're looking at you're looking at you know in excess of 20 pounds of weight loss on a machine that's already light and dynamic. It, it really made a big difference. You notice we're still running stock suspensions on these. That's not typical of us, right? So I love those things. They do work great. I, they just I they, don't mind them. Oh, I like the shocks actually. The uh, particularly the Chaos shock that has mm-hmm. high and low speed. Yes. Yep. Right. And and the RMK it was a decent package. Something that guys should know. The RMK did ship. A lot of them shipped. Uh, without the proper calibration on the rear spring, mm-hmm. they, they were too high, right? So we had to yeah. back the rear rear spring down to the factory spec. Yeah, and it, it was significant, like high. 15 millimeters too high or something. <clears throat> That's quite a bit. So if people found that their RMK cal on velocity was a little bit bouncy, uh, they may want to look at that and make sure that they back that back down because that was an issue. Not Other quite than as playful, right? Yeah, it just makes them not quite as playful. Uh, so So there's that. Uh, this is a Chaos 3 inch. Uh, that's a 165. 275. Yeah, 275, and that's 275, 155. So we kind of have all three variants in the stable. And uh, and it kind of depends. You know, people ask all the time, right? Mm-hmm. So so what are your guys' thoughts on that? Because we got an NA too, and what? That's 275 NA that we're yeah. running over there, you know, 155. So uh, around here, keep, keep in mind, everybody's snow is different, and everybody's conditions are different. Lola's taking a nap. She's like, this is boring, <laughs> but, and every, so everybody's riding style, conditions, snow, whatever, different. Um, I think everybody knows what my preference is and I can justify that preference, but only to me and my use to man. Mm-hmm. But what are you guys' thoughts on that? I would say that after riding all of these, I fell in love with that one. It's a three 155 inch, three inch chaos. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that, that really rang true to me when I rode that for the yeah. first time. But you are lightweight, athletic, you know. Mm-hmm. I'm an old fat guy. Carry a lot of speed. I mean, it's like, <laughs> when you, I mean, it's, it's all about your riding style. You're right. I mean, if, well, you cheat with an arc too, so. There's right. Also, hey, that, that, hey, that arc is like a piece of equipment that is like, nobody talks about anymore, right? You got Brant out there just pimping 165. It's fine. That's what I got. They're great. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe in Sugar Snow where he rides, it's a great thing. My personal opinion is I, I don't love the 165. It's, it's, in fact, it's, this is what's proven so far this season. Mm-hmm. When we go to leave the trailer, it's the last one anybody wants to take. That's funny. 
It does push a little. Yeah. It pushes, which long snow. tracks do. Right. In and the deep snow, it, it is the king. It is still mm -hmm. maintains. Yeah. It, it, it does and if you want to flat get stuff done <clears throat> and beat every, all of your buddies to the top of the hill and get them stuck, this is yeah. what you want to be on. Right. But there's also something to be said about maneuverability and fun. Well, let's remember, why do we ride these things? To beat yeah. everybody to the top of the hill? That might be, but that's yeah. not really why, why we do it. We do it because it's a blast. I know, and I can get these things to shoot out of the snow and do a 360 in the air before they even hit the ground. Right. I mean, they right. are so, so, so it's, it's, it, but it is, I would say the three inch, uh, the, the three inch cast is something that is best a tool in the hands of a fairly advanced rider. It, it, it's not very forgiving. You, you will find yourself in the back seat if you're an, if you're an mm -hmm. inexperienced rider, right? Yeah. And, if you make and, mistake, and when you're in the back seat, by that, I mean, you're on the back of the sled, you're death wobbling. And we take a lot of clients out and we, and we work with them, uh, on tuning, but we see that as probably the single biggest mistake. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's where I was going to say that arc, man, that's a, that's something that we used to put on everything and everybody was all about it. And then when a kind of push to 165 when nobody, because an arc on a 165 stupid, don't do that. I mean, I don't mean to say you're stupid if you did it. There is some advantages. So I retract that statement. I don't want to. I appreciate but everybody that tunes into track, this. You're basically solving yeah, you, the problem. You, you, so, yeah, the, the, the arc <clears throat> will solve this problem where you can't get the front end down and you can't get the work done, and particularly with a chaos pen. Um, you, you know, you're trying, to, you're trying to make some directional changes and you're in kind of a world of crap and your pants are down around your ankles and you're yeah. looking up there going man i gotta get up there. you stared at a tree and then you stop and now you're trying to yeah. maintain your speed back and, yeah and yeah, you just, just can't it's like rrr, rrr. Yep. uh the arc will enable you to couple that rear skid hard enough that the skis will stay down and the thing will get the work done and 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 so it's such a cool tool and i wouldn't ride a snowmobile without one if skins quit making them i'd build it myself by hand it's one of the coolest tools that's ever been induced they in, are. and and, and I know there's been electric variants and other ones in the Raptor arc and the the truth is the air arc is the only one that gives you the biggest delta to, between coupled and uncoupled in mm -hmm. other words you'll have the freest sled because a lot of people that ran the Raptor it settled them down but it also settled them down when you were off yeah so I don't want to go down like too far down the arc thing but the arc's a cool tool and 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 people are giving up a lot if they're riding 155s without one and they're they're underestimating the advantage that they'll have, but that's okay because because we all like to have the advantage we can have. Exactly. So these guys don't have arcs on theirs. So like, how'd you do that? Just push the magic lever. So. <laughs> we just have to go faster. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> try it. Work a little harder. Yeah. So, um, so so that's it. We get them through break in. We get uh, we start to find out that there's some improvements that can be made in clutching. So we've we've been developing a, a bunch of different uh, clutch configurations, right? Enough mm -hmm. that you guys are sick of it because I, I, you know, I go out and ride them and I send them out and ride them and I look at the data and, and, uh, and then I, I say, oh, guys, change this. And then they do yeah, And then, oh, guys, change this. And so sometimes we're in these clutches five, six, seven times a day. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it's, it's cumbersome and, and we go the wrong direction. And, but we're learning. Yeah. I also learned the hard way, actually. Contrary to what mm -hmm. even my... Uh, so even some of the individuals uh, involved in development, I don't want to say too much there, but that warned me of, uh, against something, and and uh, and, I, and I went a direction with clutching that will be consistent with what a lot of tuners would do on turbo, mm -hmm. because we're going back to a philosophy that was based on, you know, conventional wisdom, what we've been dealing with in terms of turbo, mm -hmm. and, and so we applied those things. We're like, man, if we just do what we've done on turbos, we'll make these things even better. Doesn't and, matter. And no. Holy cow, it was unrideable, wasn't it? Yeah. People will learn the hard way. You think you think you got a bog problem. You got a bog problem if you apply conventional wisdom to these. Mm -hmm. And by that I mean I mean I'll go ahead and say this. Reverse cam helix and things that we used to do are reverse angle helixes, meaning we start out shallow and go steeper. Don't work on these. And go ahead, let your tuners do what they will and you'll find out that you'll induce a bog. You can't uh, you gotta catch these things. And they do a fantastic job of controlling the boost ramping and and there's literally thousands of correction tables, hundreds yes. applied to just wastegate operations, and turbo controls, mm -hmm. and and I'm and I'm I'm fastly learning all of these and, and their functions and and have been able to enhance performance characteristics of these specific to use them and uh, and and different of course fuel strategies, but <clears throat> that said, you can get yourself in a lot of trouble clutching. And, and by that, I mean, you, you will have bogs that you might even bitch about on the internet saying these things suck. And it's all because you decided to clutch it a certain way. Mm -hmm. and, and, and take it from me, I did it. 
I did it. I we mean, learned I wrecked. very fast. That yeah, what I wrecked we used several to do days. Is not going to work anymore. No. Yeah. So, so, so we're looking with a at lot things. of everything too. I mean, look at the technology that's in this turbo compared to anything we've ever seen. It's right. all different and it's all updated and it's all state of the art. I mean, well, it's it things is, we always dreamed of. Exactly. Right? I we're mean, like, we now have all the could. tools and switches and things to fiddle with that we've always wanted to mess with. And you know, the difference. We have the opportunity. That smart valve on the pipe is the, the, the magic valve. That, thing right. is that was the difference piece. between whether we could run three pounds of boost with pump gas on a stock 850 yep. or eight pounds of boost at 10,000 feet, I'm talking about. Yeah. And, and a lot of people don't understand these systems, but these systems adjust for altitude. I've been saying this for years. A lot of aftermarket turbos do not. We've always embraced ones that do. Yes. So that said, the, the, the advantage to turbo is that you can go down to sea level and you know push three or four pounds and still have 200 horsepower, or you can go to 12,000 feet and, and you might be at nine pounds to have that same 200 horsepower because obviously the, the ambient difference there. And so the net horsepower differential between you know from sea to sky is is nil, and negligible. You, you, there'd be some difference in in terms of Excel characteristics that we talked about, but. Um, before, but I don't want to go down that rabbit hole either. Like I said, this could go on forever, but mm -hmm. this is going to be a long video, like I said, but yeah. I think these things are worthy of talking about. So that's just another thing. Yeah. Um, they, they are remarkable. That pipe, the, the capacity, well, that's been what I've learned, probably frustrated you guys a little bit as we went down that road, as we kept creating problems. I know that you know you weren't happy with the profiling of, of, of the machine, right? So I'm, I'm putting you on this one. We're developing our 100 LL tune mm -hmm. and and, and it's fast as heck and yes. we're able to build tons of big end power and I'm sure that aftermarket guys other other tuners in the industry are going to start crowing about how they can build power well, but that that didn't blow your skirt up did it but uh yeah you, you didn't like that so the first like, not right out of the gate yeah first couple of weeks it was like yeah it's fast but I don't really like it and and what was going on was re realistically how we control the pipe valve Yep. And, and changing some of the aspects of how we do that. And, and without giving too much up, I'll say it's almost backwards of conventional wisdom again. It is a again. lot different than you would think it would yeah. be. Yeah. So, the, so the way that we run that, um, we, you know, relieving pipe pressures to create a more stable environment during those critical axle points, as well as, you know, we want to ramp boost, but we want to control and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah. it's a, it is a tough balance, but it's cool to have all those controls. And, and that's paid, paid, big dividends now we have a we have a tune that runs without an intercooler that is remarkable horsepower yes. that is for a non-intercooled unit this thing is yeah. bad fast and bad responsive fast. as scary as fast. responsive as a pump gas unit so there's mm -hmm. there's if no not more because yeah. that that read in the back of the air box i love that thing yeah i mean we've never had that before and it's, but again it's we had i had to go in and apply a number of timing changes and fueling changes running the 100 ll even off boost to get the feel of of the pump and that's where these this thing really started to take shape and we we were able to make some pretty big changes that and clutching like we talked about uh we do run different helix different weights uh different spring um surprisingly we're we're running the stock uh primary spring i don't care if everybody knows that yeah. we've played around with that quite a bit you guys may find that they they move there for some of the tuning but we found efficiencies and in in the in the back to kind of let things happen the way they should and with all and with new weight profiles and stuff nowadays yeah. it's it's almost better to just keep that sucker in there yeah and we've done the i mean we're, we we were playing with magnets mag, uh, magnet style weights and, and you guys are familiar with that and not a i don't love them because they're not super easy to change is one thing and because they're easy to orient wrong mm -hmm. um that's a real problem people play with magnet weights and then they're shooting get the setup they're shooting up. magnets out like 22 bullets yeah um they're, they're harder to get the original setup but you know how you have to orient the the polarity of the magnet the same of course in each stack mm, yes. but each stack has to be the same as well and if you turn one magnet over in one stack it'll spit those magnets out that hole yep. and people screw that up all the time that's and pretty low. dangerous it, <laughs> just it <be> is safe. <laughs> so uh we've kind of migrated towards a set screw feedable set screw like the boondocker high energy which we're also testing with uh but to have the ability to adjust weight characteristics externally is uh, is really cool so uh but anyway so so clutching so so I, I don't know that we've we've uh, arrived uh we're we're in route i would say to perfecting all of these tunes and setups but we have reached a point of being highly evolved in fact we released 
some of these tunes to the public via the VTI tool. Um, and if anybody's interested, hit us up. And, and Even we, the pump gas tune. Yeah, we're There's able to make enhancements, make, make the up. machine better, clean it up, a little bit better response, a little bit better performance, particularly at high altitude. Now, there won't be, for low altitude guys, don't call me. I'm the world's worst expert on low altitude, honestly. Um, and uh, though I would say that my uh, data logging and data gathering over the past couple years has served me very well in being more competent at low altitude, right? We do have a lot of clients at lower altitudes, but that's thanks to this VTI. The VTI is a great tuner. It's the Voke Tune interface. It, it also we, data we, logs. Yeah, we've worked really hard on, on, on the transference of the, I would say relevant transference of CAN bus data to be able to be uh, both collected accurately, to be able to be pushed to my server from that device while you're in the field and I can read it and I can make adjustments and I can push a, re a, a refined tune back to that to address any issues that I see. Um, and I can do that all remotely, which is a service that's never been offered in, in the industry before. I will probably release a video on VTI, yep. but I just well, was gonna say that's been the magic. Uh, no, basically that, cool. yeah, yes. that, that, that thing has got us collect, I mean, we have data from, you know, uh, Alaska to, to South America. Um, and Not to mention, if your snowmobile's broken, pretty much everything that this thing records, we can pretty much tell what's yeah. wrong. Most and the, 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 the stuff south of the equator is really interesting because the turbos spin backwards. Mm. <laughs> yeah. You know, like when you flush your toilet? And the, <laughs> right. Uh, geez. That was some pretty bad dad humor there, as oh, my kids would say. Like All right. So, <laughs> so anyway. Um, so let's talk about a couple of the issues. So, so cons, like we talked about all these really cool things. Um, cool things that these things do. There's still some things that they don't do. Um, one of the things that the slash, probably all matrix, we haven't had any normal matrix non-slash, is the, the rear section of the tunnel. I know that people are posting a lot of pictures and stuff, Ben. The rear section of the tunnel is undoubtedly weak in comparison to what Polaris riders have been accustomed to because they do not have a huge extruded heat exchanger mm -hmm. to the right. back of it and that's a real real problem for some guys well, but we're I would, working on it yeah so we've we've designed a, a bumper we also do have uh, the next level bumper which we need to get on our test buggy and didn't yet but uh, all of these bumpers that are being available uh, being made available are gonna are gonna competently help with that we we just put an emphasis on strength in the in the point where um where they've been now we're going to be the last to market with the voke bumper so you can get on a list to get them ordered but i just want to say that the reason i did that we did that was because we really actually wanted to wait and see where everybody bent them and and then we wanted to focus our efforts at putting strength in just the right place rather instead than just, just a, guessing yeah it's just a great big gaudy plate on the side of the thing yep. let's put the let's put the strength where we need it so we have uh, some guys who work with uh that do some some stress modeling for me and and have come up with a way to uh, reinforce the area without it being too heavy so when our bumper does drop it will be the best one out there the other thing to keep in mind when you're buying a bumper and like i said they're all they're all going to do a job and, and do it better than than what's stock but be careful to to keep a bumper that's narrow and lean in the back. There's a few of them that come up and yeah. kind of you big and body. You don't want to go through They're all just... this engineering and all this work to throw a big old monstrosity back there that ruins everything that Polaris system. Right. So. I, I'm not going to say brands, but we saw a couple of them were like, man, that's that's wide. It's 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 hanging way out there. Mm -hmm. uh, that that that's not the heavy. point. We these are to be light and, and efficient, and narrow. So so let's, so that's one drawback to slash that people will bitch about. I think. Uh, the elephant in the room. We'll just throw it out there. Yeah, let's get to it. Let's get to Everyone it, man. Wants to hear it. Yeah, sounds like somebody's got a milling machine running in my fuel tank. Uh, I keep getting a low pressure warning. If I get yeah. one more phone call saying, "Hey, my fuel pump's loud." Yep. And bad. And uh, so, so we've all fielded that, right? Mm -hmm. It sucks. Uh, Truthfully, it is an issue that. Yeah, we got like uh, you know we've probably dealt with twenty or thirty of them already. Uh, it's it's an issue. So we. Uh, we at Vogue like to understand the problem and and then address the problem. So we've been working with engineering as well as, well, you can probably pan over here and see our little makeshift flow testing system. Science mm -hmm. project. Yeah. 
that was our science project right there. <laughs> we so tested we're, about 15 pumps in that thing. <laughs> yeah, so we're able to simulate full load, all four injectors wide open uh, at, at high boost with that and, and, and actually watch, the, and, and to be honest with you guys, this pump thing is bigger, it, it's broader, I would say. Than, than people realize. I think there's more going on there than people. Everybody's got to, you know, right. oh, I'll put a 255 Walboro pump and it'll be done. That don't won't make a crap bit of difference. To, first of all, yeah. first of all, those 255 pumps are built to have a filter on the bottom of them and you can't run that pump mm -hmm. on this system. Uh, I hear, man, the, the threads are enormous, dude. I, like, yeah, there are it's... hundreds and hundreds of comments by experts on the internet. I'll, 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 <clears> yeah, about 99% of them are wrong. So the, the <clears throat> people are like, how does the return line pickup feel? There's a there's what's called a jet pump. The jet pump is on the uh, is on the rear pickup, and so the rear pickup sits under the jet pump as the return fuel comes back around. It's forced through an orifice uh, or, or a ventry, sorry, and, and then there's an orifice on the bottom of it, which creates this huge negative suction event to feed the reservoir. That's the black little tank inside the tank, and and people don't understand what any of that is. There's two little umbrella valves on the bottom of the Reservoir that are designed to in that pump if you want. Um, right. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe that's a good idea. Let me, uh, let me grab the pump. But either way, don't just jump to conclusions either and assume way, you, you have are, a bad you pump. You guys are mostly wrong about this. So, but we will tell you what we find, what we've been finding, and and, and what's going on uh, to to work on. So, so this little guy right here is called a jet pump. And this is a, a fuel pickup sock, they call it. Um, and so this, you can see the form of that plastic. It, it's a ventry, and then it draws fuel in. It feeds us. Now this pump is circulating 120 liters per minute. That's way more than we used to. So there's a ton of horsepower worth of fuel in this. But the, pro, the, the idea was that because of the, the sheer length of this tank, the long sock thing, which really didn't work that good, when the tanks got low anyway, mm -hmm. needed to be redesigned. So Polaris spent an enormous amount of money developing this system. So this jet pump draws in fuel and feeds this reservoir. There's another sock just like this that lays in the bottom of this and is connected to this pickup, which is the, the fuel inlet for this, this pump. The reason a 255 pump won't work is it doesn't have this style of fitting on the bottom. It's designed to have one of these socks stuck to the bottom of it and it doesn't have a barb fitting. So there's no way to reliably put a connection on and do that, not to mention that putting that pump up into this uh, would, would be, uh, I mean, it doesn't have the right nipple on the top. Yeah, either. you have to get a hose or So I don't know, I think it's a stupid, it's a stupid idea. There may be a pump out there that would fit this application. walboro has got a bajillion pumps. Um, but anyway, in fact, Walboro engineers will be here in my shop in a couple of days working through some of this to, to make sure we fully understand it. But what we've seen is a number of this, this is a fuel pressure regulator right here, and this white retention ring that goes around these four standoffs. We've seen a number of these missing. Um, we've seen some prongs that were pushed out and regulators pushed up so that there's an, there'll be an O-ring pooched out along the edge. If that's the case, you're certainly going to make a lot of noise and have a real problem. Now, I gotta warn you guys, if you think you're gonna take this out competently and put it back in, um, without special tools. Without special tools and without knowledge of, of how delicate it is. I'm not telling you that you guys, because I got a lot of competent clients, a lot of competent followers, and, and you guys are competent. You know what you know what I'm talking about. But um, I, I can tell you that I think I'm about tired of seeing broken fuel gauges because somebody can't pull this out of the mm -hmm. tank. I would recommend just it. leaving it in there and bringing it. Right. It's, yeah. a, it's a warrantyable. You know, you just issue. be be careful. But anyway, so this where this return line comes into this tank too is another one that we've seen come out. Um, we've seen a lot of issues with uh, with with turbulent inlets caused by these socks, um, where we're taking in a lot of air and it's cavitating just the, the fuel pump so fast. That it's yeah, it's drawing this down into a suction. I think it's pulling it up against the bottom of the. Uh, of the inlet, restricting the flow, causing the pumps to be noisy. As the fuel gets hot, this problem gets worse because these these uh, nylon components in here that are built to kind of hold some mm -hmm. some uh, some rigidity to that and and keep the inlet they open. A softer, they right? get softer and they get sucked up against the bottom, and and that's 
part of the reason why guys will say, well, geez, I, I put my sled on an incline and the problem went away. I left it sit there for a while. Or I uh, shut it off and started it and the pump wasn't making noise anymore. <clears throat> that, that's almost exclusively basically holding your finger over the inlet of the pump. It'll make pretty loud screaming noise. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't mean the pump's bad. I, boy, I've, I've pulled apart a lot of these pumps down to literally deforming the uh, you know the, the the metal to while well, you guys Dis were here yeah disassemble, we're, the, pump disassemble the pump itself take the gear rotor components out of the pump uh and, and inspected them in fact one that wouldn't pass our flow test would only run 19 pounds we took apart and cleaned and put back together and put different inlets on it and different zock and, and yes you can put them back together but don't do this at home folks this is technical stuff uh and and and, and we got it to pass so so we're having this problem anyway bottom line is they don't all need a new fuel pump, though a new fuel pump might be a Band-Aid. I think the problem's gonna be there until we really, really sort out what we what we gotta do, right? Yeah. And, and, we're and, and, and we're on it, they're on it. There's no Band-Aid, somebody says put oil in it, somebody says put, I have heard so many BS stories, put those pipe around this. Uh, it does help to safety wire these in to make sure that they don't come off or whatever, but by and large, this isn't that bad. There's also a the issue of the little shelf in here and the o-ring and we guys we already we machined a part to put in here to hold the o-ring up so that it wouldn't fall into that notch if you guys are taking them apart and, and and honestly all those things might help with minor leakage issues past the regulator but they're not the primary issue um, primary and, they, and and it's not a bunch of defective pumps we're putting air in them and we're starting them to fuel and we've got to solve that that's it in a nutshell it really sucks yeah but we'll get through it. It's just, it's going to take... But there's not as many of them going out as people are saying. No, um, they're exaggerating. The noisy pumps <laughs> will happen in certain circumstances, and, 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 and it will go away. Uh, I would, you know, recommend, you know, running them as full as you can. And uh, when the tank's the full, it's less. The normal, right? It's the less noise less is. I mean, they are, they are adapt to, or they are likely to make a lot of noise, particularly when they get warm. Yeah. So they're noisier than they have been in the past. So, um, but... Not everyone that you think needs a pump needs a pump, and if you're having that problem, um, right. bear and with until, us. And until you're losing fuel pressure, your pump's not bad. It's right, and but <clears throat> but even when you do, like all the units that well, we just took two boosts up, you know, whatever two days ago, that absolutely, as soon as you cob the throttle, the pump pressure, you know, code came on, and 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 let's be honest, we brought those down here, and we 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 did our thing, and we reinstalled them, and they passed, and they worked. Yep. And didn't need a new pump wasn't the pump's fault um but there are problems and, and i don't want to get too far down that hole either just know that they're on it and it's Be not the end of the world Be patient we're gonna get through it it's just a, yep. yeah it's not the end of the world and if you got a good dealer uh keep throwing new pumps in them every 250 miles <laughs> yeah <laughs> tell we're through that but just because they make noise don't mean you need a new pump i guess that's that's the moral of that right. all right uh so so there we did we dealt with that we dealt with that that's what you got um other cool things, the new clutch is awesome. You don't have to adjust your oh, belt. Oh man, no more belt deflection. Yeah, I just saved weight on my sled, not having an eighth and inch the Allen and a seven sixteenths be... wrench anymore. <laughs> you the sound like me. Seems to be pretty <laughs> impressive too. I mean, yeah. How many wheelies have you done? On yeah, belt, belt life, man. Yeah. I used to be stoked if I could get two hundred miles out of a belt, and now There's... I'm. Pff, Dude, you wrecked a belt every day when you rode I it the to. way you rode these. Yeah, and that's I was just yeah. I mean, that that's two hundred miles, but whatever you just said was a lie. <laughs> You had we cords like hanging out of every belt. Yeah, 300 miles on a, on mm -hmm. a boost. It's yeah, I mean, that's just, it's impressive it's considering the power that they're making. And, yeah. and, uh, and I Especially love the, the high, you know, the the high speed them. power, too. I, I don't mean, know what I attribute that to either because, you know, the clutch changes were, I, I, mean, I guess maybe that is a little bit more open and cools better, but I don't, I don't know. I, right. I don't really know. And I haven't put a, really <clears> I haven't logged that temp down there. Maybe we're doing a better job of clutching. We're geared low. For mm -hmm. sure, these things gear out like crazy, man. Like you got to be careful with that, you guys. You reckon you're gonna wreck tracks and parts if you just hold them mm -hmm. wide open at 80 miles an hour. Miles an hour. Jeez, yeah, yeah. They, they they'll get to the end of gearing and then they're just pushing the belt out the top of the clutch and really being mean to parts. And they're they're really undergeared. Everybody's like, man, I'm gonna gear my boost down. So I, no, nah, you're an idiot. Yeah, it's you're already. Fine. I it's will already hold to that well. one. You guys are dead wrong. Yeah. Gear these things down and you're just shooting yourself in the foot. Mm -hmm. Stupid. They're geared so low right now. That you can barely get 83 miles an hour out of them at 8,500 RPMs, and 
and <clears throat> they'll do that in about four and a half seconds yeah. on flat ground. So yeah. I just when they run like this right out of the box, I don't know why you'd even attempt to mess with it. Well, and that's the thing. You, if you consider that you're turning up hills or whatever, and we're seeing speeds uphill at 61 miles an hour track speed on our tuned units, 61 miles an hour. Um, you gearing it down would put you well outside of your efficiency. Your efficiency is around, you know, 60 percent of the, the the shift phase, and and so by gearing it down, you'd push yourself up that shift phase. Your efficiencies would drop. So you're not going to go as fast either. And you might think you perceive a bottom end rippiness change, but I don't think so. These things are rippy on the bottom. Yeah. Gearing we've talked about. You can watch my gearing 101 video if you want more opinions on that. But anyway, I think they're geared plenty low, uh, if not too low in some cases. Yeah. So. Uh, but that's for our style of riding, and we're not everybody. So ergonomically, they like to be rode fast. Um, just the chassis and everything. The faster you ride it and going uphill, it just it just loves it. What I've noticed. More stable. You have more, more stable, room. Easier to easier to maneuver around. You do notice the more room, right? Yeah, you got more room to move around. Forward, you don't yeah, bang your knees on everything. It's it's awesome. Yeah, it's it's a whole it's a game changer. Feels like you don't. I, I don't know why this is, but Matrix. Higher bars feel higher than they did on the axis. Is that weird? Yes, I would like the agree. same, like a mid or That's high so bar on an axis, like it was too high. But for, for me, because I'm only five ten, but yeah. the but but honestly, when I get on a mid bar, even on a matrix, it feels just way too high. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So high bars, I guess that's some people's jam, but certainly not not mine. Yeah. I would say it's almost yeah. as big of a jump from when we went from pro to axis. Yeah. You get used to riding an axis, yeah. you get back onto pro, and you're like, oh man. And then you ride one of these around for three weeks, and you get back on an axis, you're like, hmm. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a true story. It's significant um, changes everywhere. Yeah. It just works so well. So, uh, so other things, the, obviously the 275 got the new extrovert drivers with a, just with a cool deal straight from the factory. Little yeah. vibration. They, but yeah, you will notice, uh, I mean, like, they're almost foot numbing at speed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right, two seven five extrovert drivers um, are a little bit more more vibration than what you'd experience on the uh, three inch for sure. The three inch is whisper smooth. Everyone yeah. I rode, Very so, smooth. but obviously the two seven five is a little bit lighter. Uh, part of that's probably due to the fact that there's you know there's a larger there's a larger gap between each bar, right? Mm. So there's less physical contact. So the sprockets instead of contacting, you know, four. Uh, or five bars are only contacting three at any given yeah, time. Sure. Mm -hmm. And and so there you're gonna experience a little bit more vibration there. And uh, extroverts tend to be a little bit more so so that's there. But required uh, with the power and the and the pitch of the particular track. Yeah. yeah. And Once that, that, that the advantage it. is it's lighter, right? There's less yep. less stuff there. So mm -hmm. that's cool. Um, but anyway, so so that's so that's that's our writer's digest here. What else are we missing here? What do we love or dislove or dislike about some of the other aspects of it? What are the other things people are talking about right now? Anything come to mind that you've seen? Mm. Tunnels bending, fuel pumps are garbage, blah, blah, blah. 7S display is awesome. Anybody who doesn't have one ought to have one. They're going to wish they did. That's a fantastic piece of tech. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Truthfully, I think you know how we always expect there to be at least something mm -hmm. that's going to be going on with a new chassis or a new motor. Something we just don't like anything. or that we're really solid. Man, but for the most part, these things have been just yeah, the motors pretty are flawless. I mean, we haven't had to mess with much as far as any of that goes. Obviously leaks. I mean, yes, we've experienced some problems with, uh, well, I mean, you know, we had a unit that say wouldn't achieve boost. It would only mm -hmm. only run 7,900 RPMs and had a huge had a huge leak. That, so, I mean, there's there, there are things that, that happen during assembly and, and that's pretty normal and any competent tech will find those problems right away. Yep. And uh, to any dealers that are watching this, not that any dealers tune into my channel, but if you do, pay attention to your your riders. They're probably not lying when they say that. And if you don't have a logger, you can't know that. But uh, I know, you know, a guy hit me up recently on on Facebook that said, "Hey, I've told my dealer like three times my boost only turns 7,900 RPMs." Um, <laughs> don't yeah, don't. It, it's got a problem, and we and we and you need to pay attention. And the guys and, and riders aren't stupid. They're they're smart guys, and, and though they tend to exaggerate some of their problems, this is a message to dealers. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, I would I would recommend paying attention because that's yeah. how that's how you retain them. But we, we use the VTI. I get a VTI out to a guy, say, hey, log that thing, 
and then I can see it. I can say, oh man, you're only building two and a half pounds of boost. Yeah. And you're right, it's only turning 7,900 RPMs. Get that thing in here right away. And we get it in here and the air box is off of the throttle bodies and the clamp was left loose to the factory or whatever. It's just something and it, and it can happen. But that's, uh, I guess that's the advantage to working with us and working with the VTI or you know, something that'll, that'll actually log the data and get it to me, so. Um, Ooh, one of the things, if you guys, be careful with these things. The the quick drive, the bottom gear is so close to the bottom of the Oh plastic. yeah, the body work. If you yeah. get a stick or anything in there, you'll feel it. Just pay attention to the noise that's coming from your machine. If it sounds funny, pull your panel off, maybe put it in reverse, see if it kicks anything out of there. But we found yeah. some sticks in there, maybe wrapped a couple belts, belts and, and stuff like some that. Spring. Some springs. Some exhaust springs. <laughs> I mean, the factory does tend to leave some extra springs in the belly pan, evidently sometimes, and uh, and they will invariably end up under your quick drive belt, and they will smoke that thing. Yeah. But if you're listening, you you, you should be you'll hear you'll hear it doing it. Um, so you'll catch it. And and, and even you know it doesn't hurt a pre ride inspection every now and then. Make sure all your springs are on, and yep. you know look underneath Give your it belt. A yeah. When you're doing your oil, look at it. Yeah. You know, normally you'd be tensioning your belt and screwing off. I mean, who cares? You open a panel up and take a look. These things. No, you're right. You just put gas in the oil. So, <clears throat> um, maintenance people, maintenance. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maintenance. Ah, screwed maintenance. Um, no, that's it. I mean, uh, honestly, these things are, are pretty solid, and they're and, they're, and they're and they're really working. And it's going to be really fun. Uh, we're gonna we start our intercooler uh, field testing and validation. Um, possibly as early as tomorrow but for yeah. sure monday and and that's when we'll take them to even the next level so so we have like a you know pump tune we have a this is my shameless vti plugs but i think that people are don't realize the advantage they can have with that so um Which pump gas push an update to you at any time i mean it's, it's yeah cool. yeah we ought to do it we ought to do a bit on on just vti but anyway our 100 ll tunes ripping if you want to beat your buddy it's fast just, significantly uh, fast little we just uh we just change clutching we send you clutching a vti with a tune in it already and and you just drain your tank and put a straight hundred in it and go riding and beat beat all your friends so yep. um that's a good time uh otherwise we're gonna keep uh keep doing what we're doing get back out on the snow book some more miles um and keep working these things out but we'll be back to you with another report of as the, more the aftermarket find, the more responds you know. yep more parts more things as we develop and uh and test we'll let you know but right now things are looking really good and we're just going to keep doing what we're doing so i'm happy as a clam can't can't wait to get back out on the snow thanks for yeah, tuning in guys see you later guys